Hello and welcome to the Real News coverage of the Republican National Convention in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Joining us today is Republican Congressman Ron Paul, a leading libertarian from Texas, well known for his views on limited government, low taxes and free markets. He was also the only Republican presidential candidate who opposed the Iraq War. Congressman Paul now heads up Campaign for Liberty and comes to us live from Minneapolis where he's hosting his not a counter convention, only a celebration, Rally for the Republic. Congressman, thank you for joining us. You've critiqued the neocons for going to war in Iraq, for having a vision of an American empire based on military might. My question is, is John McCain a maverick or a neocon? And how does your vision of foreign policy differ from McCain's? Well, he's closer to being a neocon. I guess you have to define what a maverick is. Sometime if you say that John McCain is a maverick because he joins liberals on programs like uh, McCain, McCain Feingold and joins Democrats when he votes for higher taxes, I guess you can define that as a, as a, as a maverick. But um, his foreign policy is uh, very close to the neocons. He is, he is very militaristic and believes that we should have more troops overseas, not less. So his foreign policy would be 100% opposite of mine. Uh, explain a little bit about your basic positions. I mean, I understand you would actually close American military bases around the world and bring troops home. That's a very different vision than the last 50, 60 years of U.S. foreign policy. Yes, and uh, the last 50 or 60 years has given us nothing but grief when you think about Korea and Vietnam and Persian Gulf Wars and Iraqi wars and Afghan and on and on. And it literally has contributed to our, our bankruptcy. I mean, we're spending close to a trillion dollars a year maintaining our empire, and it will come to an end, just as the economic system collapsed in the Soviet system. The uh, uh, system here is going to collapse because we can't be uh, maintaining this with our uh, ability to pay for it. Now, now, the Republican Party has been pretty close to insulting with you the, the, over the convention. You didn't get to speak. You've even had floor, f your movement on the floor limited. Why, why are you positioning as the campaign for liberty as something fighting for the soul of the Republican Party? And, and let me just add to that question. There's millions of Americans that would agree with you on your foreign policy uh, point of view, uh, on your issue of defense of civil liberties within the Constitution but who can't, don't agree with you on, on smaller government and, and some of your domestic economic positions. Isn't there a much broader front to be had here than within the Republican Party? Oh, sure, but uh, they have to come together for the one issue. Uh, some who would be considered liberals that say they like my position of limited government, civil liberties, and less uh, intervention overseas have to realize that that kind of force that they object to is the same kind of force that's used illegitimately to redistribute wealth in a socialist welfare system. So it's my rejection of the use of force to police the world or to run your uh, somebody's personal life. Uh, it is rejection of that that makes me uh, uh, reject the notion that uh, a government should uh, tell you how to spend your money and what you do with it and whether you can be involved in internet gambling and, and making these personal choices. So I believe I'm just making a consistent defense of personal liberty. But why still from within the Republican Party? It, it seems like the Republican Party wants to distance, uh, distance themselves greatly from you. Yeah, that, that is true. It's because uh, Republicans uh, profess to believe more closely to these views than, say, the Democrats do. And I, I guess it's a practical thing. I've been a 10-term uh, Republican congressman, so uh, I've remained a Republican congressman. So uh, the vehicle is uh, the use of the Republican Party. But if there's a true revolutionary spirit going on in this country, and I believe it is, it will affect all the political parties and all levels of government. So we're hoping to affect uh, change everywhere. But currently, one of the practical things is, uh, that we're doing is uh, working within the Republican Party. But uh, there's nothing sacred about that. And uh, others chose not to work in the Republican Party. But so long as they're true to these principles, it doesn't bother me very much. What do you make of the, uh, the uh, McCain's choice of Palin? It turns out that Palin, in fact, was not against the Bridge to Nowhere project. That seems to be rhetoric. And in fact, she took the federal money, just decided not to build the bridge because it was costing too much. What does this tell us about McCain's decision making? 
Well, I think in some ways uh, it was pretty shrewd politically because uh, she appeals to uh, conservatives, especially social conservatives, so it didn't hurt him politically, but I don't think it has any real impact. Uh, she's not going to be a vice president, as uh, if she were to be elected, as strong as, say, a Cheney to drive foreign policy. So even if she did come around to agreeing what I'm saying about foreign policy, I doubt very much if she could slow John McCain down. Uh, so uh, it's it's a tool and a technique to help him win the election, and, and in a way, pretty smart trick. Mm. Uh, do you see any difference between the foreign policy between McCain and Obama? No, I, I don't see any difference at all. Actually, uh, Obama uh, was more aggressive in, and first on in sending more troops to Afghanistan, and then McCain said, yeah, okay, even though Obama wants to come across as getting troops home on a timeline from Iraq, so does the administration at the moment, or at least the Iraqi government does. But he's not talking about uh, closing down all the bases in Iraq and closing down the biggest embassy in the world uh, in Baghdad. And uh, he strongly supports expanding our role and sending more money and influence into Georgia, which is there to protect the oil pipeline from the Caspian Sea down to Turkey. So there, there really isn't any different. He's never said about bringing troops home from Europe or Japan or Korea. And uh, there's a big concern about our deficit. And we use about a trillion dollars a year to keep maintain this empire. And uh, uh, the American people aren't offered a choice. The foreign policy are essentially the same. And, and, uh, and we need a lot different foreign policy if we expect to really eventually have a strong national defense. Uh, one, one final question on, on your economic policies. Uh, how would the free market deal with the climate change crisis? If you take the coal industry, which supplies the majority of American electricity and is said to uh, provide perhaps 30, 40 percent of uh, the carbon emissions in the United States, how is there a free market solution to reducing the effects of coal with any kind of time frame scientists tell us, which is whether we have a 10, 15 year window? Well, the free market is very protective of the environment, and if coal is a pollutant, and some people would argue with you, if it is, uh, they don't have a right to pollute your air or my air or anybody else's. But one thing the government could do is get out of the way, because we do know a source of energy which is cheap and clean, and that's nuclear, but the government prevents us from doing that. They inhibit the development of nuclear power. At the same time, they don't do anything uh, uh, to uh, stop pollutants in the air, and they give these uh, carbon permissions and all these things, or they go and subsidize corn uh, to make ethanol, which is not economically feasible. You need the market to operate to tell you which is the most inexpensive, and right now it's probably nuclear, nuclear energy. If it is ethanol, uh, they ought to recognize the fact that uh, the best source of ethanol is not corn. Sugarcane is a lot better, but the best source is, is hemp. And what do we do? We go to jail if we raise hemp. So uh, there's a lot the government could do to, uh, uh, you, you know, dealing with these issues of environment and pollution. In a case of national emergency, be it, let's assume the scientists are correct about climate change crisis, it is a severe national emergency, or someone were attack America, which I guess you would consider national emergency, certainly there you see a role, a role for strong government. Yes, but uh, it, strong government doesn't mean that we have troops all around the world because that's what precipitates, uh, you know, our, our crisis. So, uh, yes, there's, there's, a, there's a role to be uh, played, but uh, if there is a significant problem, you might look at how much uh, uh, hydrocarbons the Pentagon burns. And uh, out of 216 countries of the world, I think they're about the 46th largest country uh, in, in the world. And, uh, and they're, and they're uh, burning all this oil, and, and we go over there to keep, try to keep uh, our energy flowing in there, and we go over the Middle East and cause wars, dropping all these bombs certainly hasn't been an advantage to the environment. Congressman, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.